Welcome everyone to the Pasture and Identification webinar uh, with Graham Lorimer, uh, with the support of Port Phillip and Western Port CMA, the Healthy Landscapes uh, Project, uh, Practical Regenerative Agricultural Communities. In starting, I wish to acknowledge the that uh, I am on Zha Zha Run Country and the Masson Ranger Shire, which uh, is my primary employer is also on, Mas uh, on Zha Zha Run Country, Tangarang and Wurundjeri countries. And I want to acknowledge um, the <coughs> traditional owners for those people um, that you are watching uh, from and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I particularly want to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that may be joining us today for this webinar. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and I'll hand over to Robert to introduce Graham. Thanks, Jason. And um, it's great to be here with uh, all of you tonight. A real welcome to so many people here tonight. Uh, I'm from the Port Phillip and Western Port CMA, uh, and I'm running a project uh, along Deep Creek from basically from Darrowit Gwim down to Mickleham. It's called Deepening Connection. So if uh, any of the landholders uh, from that area are here tonight, a, a special welcome to you. Uh, I'm sitting in the car in Wadarung country, on Wadarung country. Um, I'd like to um, welcome our presenter, Graham. Lorimer and hand over to him to uh, run the show for this evening. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Robert. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm on Wurundjeri uh, country. Um, and uh, I hope you've all been out looking for grasses and uh, have seen the video on YouTube that I produce, which is to help people prepare for this session. And this session in turn is to help people prepare for a field day. But I notice that there are people from, I think, five countries outside Australia and people from as far flung in Australia as Queensland and uh, New South Wales, South Australia and so on. So some of you are not going to be able to come to the field day. In fact, most of you can't because we don't have enough places available. Nevertheless, um, in just coming along to this particular session, and uh, having done the YouTube video, you should get quite a sound um, foundation to learn more about grasses. The objective tonight is for me to help you understand terminology about the structure of a grass and understand the sorts of things you look at with a grass plant in order to be able to identify it and learn something about how you might manage a, a grassy area or a grass within um, whatever sort of vegetation, whether it be pasture or native vegetation or whatever. Um, but uh, if you want to be able to identify individual species of grass, then it will really help if you can come to the field day. I will be showing you this evening how to recognize things like common wheat grass and wallaby grasses collectively and spear grasses collectively and how to distinguish a spear grass from a needle grass, which is a particular problem in much of Victoria. Um, so I'll give you a bit of information about how to spot the differences and identify things, but you really can't beat actually being out in the field with somebody and showing you things. I reckon most people at this session will have tried to learn about grasses using books. And you've probably all found that that didn't work really well uh, because um, well, there's a whole range of reasons and I'll mention a few of them on the way through, but it's essentially because uh, grasses and their closest relatives, uh, grasses forming one family, but there are related families, which uh, in the rush family and the sedge family and the restio family, there are a few other smaller families. They've all, be, uh, well, they've evolved a lot more than other flowering plants. Uh, some people don't even think of grasses as being flowering plants because you don't get to see petals and so on. But they are flowering plants. It's just that they've 
evolve beyond the more rudimentary sort of flowering plants like orchids and dull things like that. Um, grasses, rushes, sedges and so on have evolved away any reliance on a pollinating insect or bird or mammal uh, and instead they use wind and because of that they don't need petals and nectar and colours and things like that uh, and instead they've evolved quite different uh, structures, often very small ones because they don't have to be able to be seen by fauna from a distance and uh, these uh, small modified uh, organs on a, a grass plant or a rush or a sedge mean that we need special terminology for them. We need to know where to look for them. So they're the sorts of things I'm going to focus on. Now, with uh, at the moment 174 people, uh, if you've got questions, we can't just have you pipe up uh, every minute or two on the way through. What we'll try to do is, um, if you put your questions in the chat, I will pause from time to time and uh, Jason and or Robert will uh, tell me what the action has been whilst I've been talking in the way of questions. And I'll uh, do what I can to answer questions that need to be answered at that point, but there'll be time at the end, as you heard before, in order for me to answer a, a range of questions. Now, uh, the purpose of giving you the exercise in the YouTube video is so that you can handle the grass plants and see what a ligule looks like on different sorts of grass plants and what a spikelet looks like on different grass plants and what the leaf blades and leaf sheaths look like on different grass plants. And that is going to give you a, a good start in this session uh, as I go through showing you all the different anatomical features and structural parts of a grass plant. Um, now, uh, you might recall that one of the last things I said to do is with your, uh, perhaps you've got an oat or a prairie grass or a large quaking grass, all of which I just found along my nature strips along my street here. They're very freely available in Victoria at the moment or Southern Victoria, and they will become increasingly abundant here, but you also still find some if anybody's from Britain, let me know. Uh, you'll probably find some there at the moment, at least of an oat uh, and a prairie grass. Um, I also ask you to collect two other grasses. You can collect more if you like, but two other grasses which differ from the ones that I've just mentioned in as many different characters as possible. Uh, characters being the things that uh, distinguish one grass species from another and that might be useful for identification. And I asked you, as you went about this exercise, to compile a list of those characters. Uh, things like I started you off with two characters. One is the length of the spikelet. And another one I think was whether or not there are runners. And uh, I hope you've put together a list of characters. You don't need to tell me what they are, and uh, there's no competition for coming up with the largest list, because the point of getting you to do that list was not so that you've got a definitive list of what you should be looking for to identify a grass. I'm going to tell you about that in the coming hour. Um, instead, it was to get you to focus on these um, different parts of the grass plant and see just how different they are because most people, when they start learning about grasses, they really struggle because they don't really know what to look for. And oh, grasses look so similar if you don't know what to look for. They, they're all basically green and they've got long, elongated, narrow leaves. And some of them are a bit different to look at from a distance, but they all look so similar until you're directed to think about just how many different things there are. Now, to give you an idea of just how many characters a botanist would use to identify grasses, I have a, a project to, uh, what's called a National Taxonomic Review of Wallaby Grasses. Uh, and in order to 
characterize the different species of wallaby grass, of which there's somewhere around 45 or 50 in Australia. Uh, I and uh, my overseas mate, Peter Linder, have a list of characters numbering well over 500. That's just to distinguish one wallaby grass species from another. Uh, there are over a thousand that can be used, but most of them are not going to be of use to people like you. Um, so I'm going to narrow it down to the important ones for you to concentrate on. But I hope you found that exercise of looking at the grasses and thinking about just how do they differ from each other useful. Uh, and with now 179 people, we can't really have a competition for who found the species that do differ by the maximum number of characters from those uh, basic grasses that I mentioned, the oat and the prairie grass and the large quaking grass. Um, so I'll, I'll show you the sort of things that you might have, uh, have come across and show you what you might need to have come across in order to have a good chance of winning any such competition. Now, if you're new to grasses, you would be uh, doing fairly well if you were to come across and uh, notice the difference in uh, this being two species of ryegrass. And the difference in ryegrass compared with any of the others is the way in which the spikelets are attached to the stem. Now, I might have to do this with that white background again. What I'll do is I'm going to swap over to the other camera. Okay, here is a, uh, a ryegrass stem, and each of these bits that stick out on alternate sides of the stem are the spikelets. And within one spikelet, like this one, you can see that there are a number of individual, what you'd call grass seeds, and they uh, break off and fall to the ground individually. So this is different from any of the other grasses in that all the other grasses have got branches in the, in the seed head or inflorescence as it would be technically called, and ryegrass just doesn't. So that's important. We've got a character there the presence or absence of branches in the inflorescence. And that's actually a really important one. I'll deal with that later. Uh, so if you came up with something like that, uh, good on you. you. You've found something that's somewhat different, but you've got to be much more radical in if you're going to win a, win a prize on something like uh, how different a grass you can find. Here is another one that is very different in another respect. This is forest wiregrass or Tetrarena juncia. It's different in its habit. These stems, firstly, you'll notice are branched all over the place. Whereas all of the grasses that I got you to collect, the ryegrass, the oat, sorry, the prairie grass, the oat and the large quaking grass have few, if any, uh, branches in the stems. In fact, usually none. This one has it all over the place. This grass climbs. And if you work in uh, mountain ash forests, you'll, you'll be familiar with this one growing to heights of three or four meters up the mountain ash trunks. So it differs in the branching, it differs in its habit, it differs uh, from those three basic grasses I got you to look for in that like the ryegrass, this, this was going to fo focus, you will see that it's got the little spikelets arranged very similarly. They're much smaller than a, a ryegrass, but the uh, spikelets, which are alternating uh, from top to bottom along that little uh, stem that runs up through the middle of the seed head. Uh, so it's got a similar structure to the ryegrass in that respect. Um, when you have a look at the individual seeds, it's different because from each one of those spikelets, there is just one seed which just fell onto my hand there. Um, and it's a completely different shape. And shape of, spike, of grass seeds is actually very important. So uh, the forest wire grass would get you a few more points towards the competition for the most radically different grass. But it can go a lot further again. 
for example, uh, I wonder how many people got bamboo. Bamboo is rather different, isn't it? In what respects? Well, firstly, the stems are bolt upright. They're made of wood. Uh, and you probably own some uh, bamboo wood things around the home. The leaves are actually very different. Um, I won't go into the, the details at the moment, but the, the junction between the blade and the sheath is very different. Um, and in fact, the old sheaths like this one here, you'll see the blade is actually uh, snapped off. They do that naturally. Um, so that one's rather different. And when it flowers, it is totally different, except that in Australia, well, in Southern Australia, at least, we rarely see them flower, um, uh, particularly the species that tend to be grown here. Uh, people from Queensland, you might well have seen bamboo flower. And when it flowers, it is radically different from uh, the other sorts of grasses that I ask you to collect. Um, and if you're going to win a competition on how radically different a grass you could collect, you could scarcely do better than this one, which many of you recognize as kangaroo grass. Kangaroo grass is radically different from those three grasses that I mentioned before. Firstly, in that it's got branch stems. So there's, there's a bit of the stem that I broke off. And yes, I did tell you to dig it out uh, by the roots. Um, but for these purposes, I wasn't going to destroy uh, a whole shoot of a grass uh, kangaroo grass plant. Um, the, uh, the leaf sheath is rather different from the other grasses that I mentioned. Can you see that along the spine of that leaf sheath, it's strongly folded? Uh, so that's different. Um, uh, let's see what else have we got. The main dis differences after that would be that the structure of the uh, seed head is completely different than any of the others. We've got uh, leaves here. And as I, go, as, as I go further up the stem, uh, I keep seeing leaves and I'm seeing some flowering parts. There's, there's something that's obviously trying to reproduce in there and uh, it's got some bristles and so on. Here's some more here. And when you see a bristle like that, it's bound to have a seed attached because those bristles help disperse seeds. You'll see that later on this evening. Um, but no matter how far up here I go, I keep seeing more leaves or what a botanist would call leafy brats. Uh, and uh, that's very different from any of the other grasses that I've shown you so far. But there are people from Queensland here. This would be pretty normal for you because in the tropics and subtropics, grasses tend to be a lot more highly evolved. And this structure of having leaves mixed up amongst the flowering parts is uh, a fairly common thing as a result of evolution in the tropics. Um, if you really wanted to know just how different this is from all the other grasses, you would need to dissect that out. There are three different sorts of spikelets inside each bunch. If I were to go in there uh, and pluck off something that you might think of as a spikelet, if it were any old ordinary sort of grass, um, there are actually six sort of spikelets in there. Only one of them has a grain in it uh, and can germinate. Uh, and uh, six others of two different kinds just produce pollen. So kangaroo grass is an amazingly different grass from all the other ones. And uh, some of you might know that kangaroo grass grows all the way from Africa through the Arabian Peninsula, through Southern Asia, right down uh, through PNG and Australia down to um, Tasmania. It must be one of the most widespread grasses in the world, but essentially it is a tropical grass. It's just managed to adapt its uh, biology enough to survive in um, the southern latitudes of Australia. It's an amazing thing. Also extremely important for a whole range of reasons, including Aboriginal cultural values, uh, pastoral values. It's quite nutritious and so on. Uh, so it's a very important grass. Okay, so uh, I hope I've shown you uh, with those few examples that 
grasses actually differ in some fairly substantial ways if you know what to look for. And so my next task is to show you what to look for. Okay, uh, and for this, I'm going to, oh no, there's one more grass that I was going to show you. This, this might just about win the competition uh, and I'll put it under the other camera. This is Kikuyu. I don't know whether anybody actually chose Kikuyu as a grass that differs um, large, uh, in large ways from all those other grasses. Uh, it differs firstly in it's a creeping and, and scrambling grass. Uh, a major thing about Kikuyu though is that the seed heads are down inside the leaf sheets. What you're seeing with these um, uh, thread-like bits they are the stigmas or the pollen catching parts of the plant. When the male, male parts stick out, they look somewhat similar, but with little yellow uh, anthers on them. Um, so uh, their whole seed head is tucked down inside the sheaves. So that must be one of the weirdest grasses that we have in Australia, at least. Um, there is actually one even weirder, but I won't go into that. Um, okay, that will do. Uh, and I will just swap cameras again. Uh, now, are there any questions that need to be answered straight away? Uh, Graham, there was a, a question about, is, are there any apps for grass identification? And if there are, which is the best one? Um, yeah, people usually ask about books, but these days, yes, of course, um, uh, an app is a logical sort of thing to try. Uh, no, I can't really, well, there's two things. There are some good online resources for a botanist who isn't too frightened about botanical Latin, particularly in how it applies to grasses. But um, for people who aren't already proficient in understanding grasses, I don't really know of any good online resources. For those of you who do have a bit of a botanical background, you're probably already familiar, well, if you're from Victoria, you're probably already familiar with the Vic Flora website. Uh, again, it relies on you understanding botanical Latin, but it's a standard thing for identifying all vascular plants um, in Victoria. There is PlantNet in New South Wales for the New South Wales people and in Queensland, there's something similar which isn't coming to mind. Um, uh, covering the whole of Australia, there is a website called Ausgrass2, or one word, AUS Grass2, uh, and that contains information about individual species. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, will have used iNaturalist, uh, and iNaturalist is a uh, an app and website where you can just upload a photograph of a plant or an animal or uh, any sort of organism and it'll have a crack at identifying. And it's remarkably good in general, but gee, grasses really challenge it. Uh, so uh, that might help, but um, grasses are not the most photogenic of plants, I've got to say. Um, so I can't really help beyond that. Uh, yeah, anything else, Rob? Robert? No, I think you continue on. But, um, okay, yeah. I will do that. I'm going to share my screen now um, with PowerPoint slides. Okay, um, firstly, if you want to have a lasting uh, resource coming out of all this, you can get the slides from my website at that address. Um, and it's also in the, right at the top of the chat uh, stuff. And uh, that will come up. I'll put a slide at the end that will have that on as well. Uh, OK. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is go through the structure of a grass plant, and I'll do it at ground level and working up, introducing you to the terminology and the bits that you really need to focus on in order to be able to identify grass plants and learn something about their, their biology and management along the way. Um, now, I mentioned one of the characters that distinguish grass plants is whether they have runners or not. And I've mentioned already that the Kuyu has got runners, 
Uh, and so, uh, well, in fact, it has runners both above ground and below ground. The majority of grasses in Victoria do not have runners. So if you find a grass that does have runners, that really narrows down what it could be. Now, I don't know, maybe when there's somebody in the audience from Colorado. I spent a bit of time on the Colorado prairie some years ago. And so I know that as a result of all of the ungulates, particularly the bison there, most grasses, or at least a large proportion of the, the, of the perennial grasses, I'll leave aside the annuals, the perennial grasses have got runners. Uh, they have to in order to be able to cope with the hooves and uh, all that sort of thing. But in Australia, it's really useful to know whether a grass has got runners or not. In fact, it's useful anywhere. So uh, that's a fairly straightforward thing that you can look for. Um, the next thing is to look for whether the plant is an annual or a perennial grass. Uh, you might be thinking, well, how can you look at something and tell that? Well, you can do that, not just with grasses, but with other plants. Um, well, rather than just looking, you, you usually have to handle things. And this is one of the things that uh, I find when I teach people botany, whether it's grasses, ferns or anything else, um, rather than just standing back and looking at them, you've got to actually handle them to feel what they feel like. And in the case of determining whether a grass is an annual or a perennial, um, I think I mentioned in the uh, YouTube video, maybe I didn't, um, that when you pull out a grass plant and you do it rather gently, I have a technique of giving it a gentle vertical jiggle if in the process of giving it a gentle vertical jiggle, you find that the soil tends to fall away from roots that are rather fine and the plant can be uprooted pretty much whole, then that will be an annual plant. Um, and you'll find the same with a whole lot of things in the carnation family or the daisy family, like a south thistle, you know, they're really easy to dig up. In fact, most of the annual weeds that come up in your vegetable patch are rather shallow rooted and easy to pull out. Now, uh, so being able to detect the difference between an annual grass, which is really easy to pull out and has wispy roots, as opposed to a perennial grass, which has to get through the tough time of the year, which in most of Victoria is through the hot, dry months of uh, January, February, March, um, and in other parts of the world are in different times of the year. But uh, perennial needs to be able to get through every part of the year, including the most difficult part, whether it be under snow or whatever. Um, it's got to have a much more uh, robust root system uh, and so they behave differently. Now, it so happens that in Victoria, other than to some degree in the Mallee, our grasses, our native grasses, are perennials. And there's really very few exceptions to that. There, there are a handful of species in the Mallee, but in the rest of Victoria, um, there are just a few species, and the main one by far is a thing called common blown grass or Lachnagrostis filiformis. Lachnagrostis meaning the grass of the lake. And so you'll particularly find it around lakes and particularly on drying mud. And the mud need only be in a wheel rut on a huge track. It only needs a very small amount of ground and it will establish there and uh, it's native. In all other uh, cases, if you're not in the Mallee and you are in Victoria and in uh, some other, well, Tasmania, well, this would apply at least as much. Um, I don't know whether we've got, yes, I think we've got some people from Tasmania here. Um, if, if you find a grass pulls out gen, uh, with just a gentle jiggle, then it will be annual. And unless it's common blown grass, it's very likely, almost certainly, going to be an introduced species. And that might be important too if you're ma managing some native vegetation and you want to make it as natural as possible. So it's really important to know what this thing, common blown grass, looks like. In fact, the other blown grasses look uh, quite similar to this. This is the stage that. Uh, most of us will be in Victoria will be seeing it look like at the moment. 
Um, and at the bottom there, some of those roots have actually snapped off. I didn't actually take this photo or collect that specimen, but uh, the, that's almost the whole root system. It's just got some uh, fine roots extending from that base. Now, uh, you can see that right in the middle and uh, towards the top, there are branches that uh, tend to radiate in what botanists call whorls, W-H-O-R-L-S. And these branches are spreading out widely and they're very delicate. And in fact, if you were to grab this specimen and shake it, um, they jiggle. Now, uh, I'm thinking that I might for a moment um, stop sharing my screen so that I can show you a real live specimen. I expect that some of you will want to be able to identify this. Um, here is a, a pair of specimens and those branches in the seed head, you can see are very floppy and fine. Um, I'll zoom in a bit and you'll get a rough idea of what the spikelets look like. Each one has a tiny bristle, which isn't very discernible. Uh, black background might make it a bit, a bit easier. I tried using a black background and uh, the compensation of the camera for the black background ruined the whole thing. Um, you can just make out some of those fine bristles and they're part of the dispersive mechanism. Um, now you'll find that some of the uh, the branches, well, if uh, I'm going to go back to my uh, sharing of the screen. And in this photo, you can see at the top that the branches have spread widely. That's the most uh, advanced stem on this plant. And the top is the most advanced part of it. Uh, and you can see that ultimately these branches spread out at right angles. And the whole seed head snaps off and blows around on the wind. Hence, blown grass, like blown on the wind. And uh, these other seed heads are, or inflorescences are younger and they have to emerge from the uppermost leaf sheath. And so initially, the whole of this broad spreading uh, seed head had to be all folded up inside a very slender leaf sheath. And it's only once the seed head or inflorescence emerges from that leaf sheath that it fans out. So at the moment, the majority of uh, seed heads that I see of this species around Baronia uh, in the foot of the Dandenongs looks like that, but some of them are starting to open out. So that's how you would recognize one of these uh, blown grasses. If you've got one of those, uh, then you've got a native. If it doesn't look at all like that and it pulls out quite easily, then uh, you probably have an introduced species. Now, uh, that, that's quite useful, not just because you've probably identified that the, the plant, if it's annual, is not native unless it's the blown grass, but it also tells you something about how to manage it. Any annual grass is going to be what I would call an opportunistic species. It needs bare ground, it needs disturbance. And so if, uh, for example, you felt you had a problem with large quaking grass or some other annual grass, then the first thing you need to understand is as long as you're going to, as long as you have soil disturbance or bare ground, then you're going to have these annual grasses. Uh, so there's no point in trying to get rid of uh, annual grasses without dealing with the reason why they are there. So even just being able to detect that a grass pulls out readily with wispy roots tells you a lot about its biology and ecology and some of the things that you might have to do in order to manage that vegetation if you don't want those annuals to be there. Now, um, in the field days, I'll show you a whole lot more implications of that sort of stuff and what you might do in response to annual grasses.
But this evening, I've got so much to go through, I'm going to have to zip forward. Um, now, uh, we've dealt with the root systems adequately. Let's have a look at the structure of the grass leaves. And I've already introduced you in the YouTube video to the uh, two main parts of the leaf of a grass. And that's also true of most, but not all sedges and rushes. There will be a sheath and whoops, a sheath down here and the blade up there. And on a grass, there will always be a definite point of junction. Sometimes you've got to look hard for it, particularly in our native poa species, native tussock grasses not so much the introduced ones, but our native tuff, tussock grasses, you need to actually look for it. But when you do, you will see that there is a definite junction between the blade and the sheath. Uh, and we call that junction the collar. And the collar is where the ligule is situated. All grasses in Victoria, native or introduced, have got a ligule. It's just that in most, in many cases, they are so small that you will need a hand lens or a microscope to see them. There are, there's only one genus in Victoria which doesn't have a ligule at all. That's the barnyard grasses or the echinocloas. Um, so, uh, and, and they're weeds of drains and irrigation channels and that sort of thing, uh, often in roadside drains. Um, so all other grasses have got ligules. Now, uh, the sort of things that you can use to help identify a grass include the obvious ones of how long they are and how wide they are. But it turns out that those things are actually quite variable within a species according to the growth conditions. So um, yeah, you can use that and it's in, uh, quite useful, particularly if you've got particularly broad or particularly long leaves. Um, but if you've got short or uh, narrow leaves, you don't know whether that might be simply the result of the growing conditions and that in other conditions, they might be long and broad. Okay, so length and width, yeah, it's something to notice, but it can't be used very much as an acid test for identification. Um, that's also to some degree true of the cross-sectional shape of the blade and the sheath. And the two can be completely different from each other. And I've drawn some cross-sectional shape possibilities. They can be folded in a V, they could be flat, as in the case of the oat. And if you have a look at uh, all three of the grasses that I asked you to see if you could collect, you might've only got one of them, but whichever one or ones you've got, they've all got flat leaves uh, when they're healthy. Uh, they may have, uh, since you collected them, started to curl up around the edges. Some grasses do that even when they're healthy, but a lot of grasses, once you've collected the leaves, tend to curl in at the edges. And that can make it a little harder to know from your dried out specimen what it was like in the field. So there's a tip if you're collecting grass specimens to identify at some later time. Um, pay attention to the cross-sectional shape when they are fresh. Uh, some grasses will do this sort of thing, uh, curl in on their edges, we'd call them inrolled leaves, when they're fresh, and others will do it uh, only after they dry out. If it's doing it when they're fresh, that can be really important, particularly for the native poas, which are really hard to identify in most other respects. Um, okay, so there's a cross-sectional shape and you'd be looking at the blade and with the sheath, the thing you'd be looking at is whether it has that fold that I showed you in the case of the kangaroo grass. Uh, some of you may have collected something like a, uh, an earharta or velt grass if you're in Victoria. Uh, the two main species um, are both very common and uh, something that most people don't notice is that although the leaf blades are as flat as in this photo that I'm showing you, which is of an oat, uh, the sheaths have a really sharp fold along the spine. In other words, um, I'll use my cursor to show you that running along uh, 
the length of the sheath, there is a sharp fold. And not many of our grasses are like that. There's the kangaroo grass, there's the uh, ear harters or velt grasses. Um, the coxfoot, which will be well known in part, uh, to people who have pasture, it has a somewhat folded um, spine along the sheath and that helps to identify it as distinct from the phalaris that you might also have in your paddock. Those two species look rather similar, particularly when they've been grazed, but it doesn't matter how much they've been grazed, if you've just got uh, one tiny leaf left on the plant, you have a look at the sheath, which will be there, and check whether it's got a, a fold along the spine, and that'll tell you uh, with surety whether it's uh, a phalaris or Toowoomba canary grass, as opposed to a coxfoot. So noting the cross-sectional shape of a sheath can be really good. Then there's a whole lot of touchy-feely things and subjective things, floppiness, uh, as in the case of the, those branches that I showed you on the blowing grass, they're, they're floppy. Uh, now we can apply the same sort of principle to the leaves. And that's something that you sort of get your, your um, uh, it's an acquired skill, I guess, and it's not something that can be put into a book or an app or an online resource. It's something that you develop the knack for after handling grasses for a long time. And so much of becoming a good field botanist relies on those subjective sort of things. Same with the colour and gloss. Uh, sometimes similar uh, looking grass species differ quite substantially in their colour and gloss but it's something that's rather difficult to put into an identification resource because we all see colors a bit different from, uh, well, we all have our own uh, color calibration and uh, uh, the way we perceive gloss. Hairiness is very useful. Uh, most plants have got hairs of one degree or another, and sometimes those hairs have very rough bases, or sometimes they're just sharp tooth sort of uh, projections on a, a plant, and that's certainly true on particularly the blades of grass leaves. So uh, the roughness and hairiness is very useful. And I think I showed you in that YouTube video that in the case of the prairie grass, it has lovely soft hair sticking out pretty much at right angles or, or down, downwards somewhat on the lower leaf sheaths but never on the blades. Uh, some grasses are completely the opposite. So noting whether grass leaves, whether it be the blades or the sheaths are rough or hairy is very important. And just for the bromus species, which includes the prairie grass, there is that feature of the degree to which the sheaths are split along their lengths. Uh, so in this photograph of the oat, you can see, and you will see if you handle your own specimens, that um, the sheath does not completely encircle the stem uh, like a cylinder, a closed cylinder, but it's effectively split along its length. If you have a look at a prairie grass, if you happen to collect a prairie grass, you'll find that the split only goes a relatively small fraction of the full length of the sheath. It's very unusual in that respect. You know, I, I think of, of uh, Bromus as having something like a a v-neck or a plunging neckline um, for the uh, split of the sheath, whereas nearly all other grasses, there are a few exceptions, are split right down to the base or very close to the base of the sheath. And the base of the sheath is the node, the, the bumps that you will find on most grass stems once the stems are developed. So you'll note that I've labelled the stem at this part of the photo, what we're looking at immediately above the node is not strictly the stem. The stem's inside there, but what we're seeing is the base of a leaf sheath. And uh, I, could, I could have peeled that open to reveal the sheath inside it. So the degree of splitting on a few occasions can be important for identification. Now, um, the collar has some important identifying features. Uh, firstly, in distinguishing a grass or a, uh, well, a grass is a member of a particular family. The Poaceae family is the botanical term for it. Um, some uh, 
rushes and sedges and related species also have collars. And some of them not only have collars, but have ligules as well. So you, I know some books will tell you that if you're trying to identify a grass, you better make sure before you use a grass identification guide that really is a grass. So look for a ligule. Well, firstly, most or a large proportion of grasses have ligules that are so small that you may well not notice it at all. For example, a wallaby grass ligule is half a millimetre long and just a line of hairs. Uh, a native poa will often be less than that, less than half a millimetre long. So you won't always see the ligule. And in any case, even if you see the ligule, that doesn't stop it being a, a rush or a sedge because some of those have got ligules. Um, but if you find a grass that definitely doesn't have a ligule, then that's, uh, that can be useful. Um, when you can see a ligule, it can be a really useful identifying feature. In fact, whilst flowering material is the most useful stuff in nearly all cases for identifying a grass, many of you, particularly pastoralists and people on bush crews managing native vegetation, would really like, I know, to be able to identify grasses when they're not flowering. I'll show people how to do that to some degree in the field days. Um, but the hint is, um, after looking at the, uh, at the leaves and looking at the cross-sectional shape of the blades and the sheaths and that sort of stuff, you then very quickly focus in on the collar and you look for a ligule and you see what the ligule is like. It may be thick and opaque, it may be covered with hairs, it may be jagged at the top, it may be just a line of hairs. It might be a centimetre long or it might be half a millimetre long. All of those things matter because it turns out that the ligule, unlike most parts of a grass plant, is going to look pretty similar within a species regardless of the stage of growth or the growing conditions. In a drought, grasses will, or if, if the grass is trampled, the whole plant will shrink down in size, but the ligule will still look pretty much the same. Some species can vary slightly, but uh, not compared with the overall size, shape, colour of a, a grass plant. So ligules and other features around the collar are really important if you want to be able to identify a grass when it's not flowering. Okay. Um, so here is a list of the sorts of things that you would be looking for, uh, the length of the ligule, the shape, how hairy and thick it is, whether it's got a jagged top or a line of hairs across the top, how transparent it is, all of those sorts of things are useful. But again, the reminder that if you don't see a ligule, it might be that you need to apply a hand lens and uh, a little time tends times 10 hand lens you can get from eBay for a few bucks is really handy for botany in general and particularly for grasses. Or I think, uh, well, you can probably see over, over my left shoulder here, a couple of microscopes. Every home should have a stereo dissecting microscope. They're so cheap these days at a few hundred, bu a few hundred bucks. Um, now, for, for those who uh, want to become expert at identifying grasses not in flower, here are some of the things that you can use. In a wallaby grass, they have in nearly all cases some distinctive hairs at the collar. The, the out, well, the, the collar has uh, a part that might you might call shoulders. Books will sometimes call these the shoulders. So we've got the blade of this hill wallaby grass. This is Richardosperma erianthum. You can see the blade, you can see the sheath, and at the top of the sheath, you can see these hairs. And a lot of people who half know about grasses will tell you uh, to look for the hairy ligule, and particularly for these longer hairs at the side of the ligule. Uh-uh. Remember, a ligule is down inside that junction at the base of the blade. And it's only it's got a line of hairs that's half a millimetre long. But what you're seeing here quite clearly, I think, is that these are hairs on the outside of the collar. It isn't a ligule. You could call it an exoligule, but that's not a very widely used term. But anyway, so there's something about wallaby grasses. Uh, then there's things about weeping grass, where um, along with a number of other species, such as this common wheat grass, um, 
the, uh, the collar flares out rapidly at right angles uh, at the top of the sheath where it attaches onto the blade. I call it a flange because I've got some engineering background and you know in engineering for plumbing a bit of plumbing or something like that where it fans out at right angles you call it a flange so uh, one gets the knack of recognizing the particular appearance of a weeping grass collar because it does that thing fanning out at right angles it's usually got this paler color and it's got some bristly hairs there so uh, once you get a bit of practice, you can use that to identify uh, a weeping grass, Microlina stipoides. That's good for pasture. So uh, pastoralist graziers amongst you um, might want to be able to recognize that. Most uh, graziers don't even realize that this is in their pasture, but in, uh, well, south of the divide in Victoria, it's a really common uh, component of pasture. Common wheat grass is very common in, um, woodlands, um, native pasture, uh, grasslands, forests, it's very widespread. And uh, it is a little bit similar in appearance at this point to the weeping grass, but it also has these little, I think of them as being like arms reaching out to hug around the stem. Uh, so that would be another feature. Some of the rye grasses have that as well. Okay, we have finished with the, uh, with the leaf um, part of the uh, session. So I'm going to ask Robert, are there questions specifically related to leaves that I should deal with? Uh, you're good, Graham. Good, because um, we're going to run out of time otherwise. Good, uh, I'll, I'll keep going. I'll go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let's see, here we go. Next thing is stems. This is really important. Most people don't focus anywhere near enough on stems. Stems tell you a lot about uh, biology and stage of development and that sort of thing. And I need to, well, in fact, I'll, I'll unshare because uh, I want to want to use some hand gestures because I always find this hard, hard to deal with. Uh, I don't know about other uh, lecturers ever during this sort of explanation. Now, um, uh, I don't have a, an excellent specimen to show you here. During the winter months in the temperate zones of the world, uh, or even in the tropics for that matter, uh, a, a well in the wet zones, uh, wet season in the tropics particularly, a grass plant will put up new shoots, and a new shoot will start with a single leaf, and it will have a, a sheath, and it will have a blade. So if you can imagine that very first leaf coming up, and it will have this cylinder formed by the, that first leaf sheath and the blade will stick out. The next leaf that that shoot produces will come up inside that leaf sheath. So we've got the cylinder formed by the first leaf sheath and the second leaf arises by protruding up inside it and the blade will come out and flop to one side. And then we will have a second leaf sheath enclosed within the first one. And we've got two blades now. And you can imagine that this keeps on going with each successive leaf coming up inside the protection of the cylinder formed by the earlier leaf sheaths. It's a protective mechanism. All of the new tender leaf sheaths or, or leaves come up having some protection by the surrounding older uh, leaf sheaths. Uh, and this is true of most grasses, not all as I'll explain in a minute, but this is your average tufted plant like your prairie grass, oat, uh, large quaking grass and so on. Um, so once we get to flowering season, it all changes. If you've got this mental pit, picture, as I hope you do, of a, of a shoot of a grass plant with a whole lot of leaf sheaths, uh, one inside each other and each having a blade, those leaf, each leaf um, is attached to the whole shoot by nodes. Those nodes that I, I pointed out in the earlier photograph, those nodes at that stage are one on top of the other with no stem in between them. 
And so each of the leaves is really compacted down. But flowering season comes and the space between the nodes elongates. If you think about an old fashioned uh, car radio antenna, and I've been running these courses since 1988, so it was perfectly normal. Then now there's probably a generation of people out there watching this um, webinar who don't even know what I'm talking about. But we used to have these things back in the old days, a car radio antenna. And if you can imagine each segment of this telescopic device having a, a blade attached to it and a, a leaf sheath, then that's essentially what happens at flowering time for most grasses, uh, particularly in the temperate zones of the world, whether it's in Britain or the United States, calendar, Canada, New Zealand or wherever. But there are some exceptions. Okay, so hopefully you've got that picture. Uh, and I, at that point, am going to share my screen again because there are all sorts of things that flow from this. Okay, so we've got the stems forming inside the leaf sheaths. Um, and uh, as I've just explained, most grasses uh, will um, delay the elongation of the stem until flowering season. That's an adaptation to grazing because the seed head is uh, protected down inside those cylinders formed by the leaf sheaths until the last possible moment. And if you go mowing your lawn or grazing your paddocks, you'll know that once you finish your mowing or take the, the stock off, the grasses will put up a stem and flower within sometimes as short as a week, uh, certainly within a couple of weeks. Uh, so it's a, a way of minimizing the risk of the flowers and seeds being eaten. Um, so that's the way a whole range of grass species uh, work, but not grasses like common reed, Phragmites australis, which will perhaps be known to those of you from the Northern Hemisphere who are watching, as well as from our hemisphere. Um, so uh, common reed, um, Phragmites australis or uh, Phragmites communis, um, and all of those um, reed-like grasses, also the creeping grasses such as the kikuyu, the scrambling and climbing grasses like the forest wire grass I gave you, they have got perennial stems, not a stem that's just poked up briefly to flower set seed and, and then die the way a tufted grass does. All of those grasses that form a, a reed-like habit or that creep or climb have got perennial stems and they will branch. And uh, every time they put on a new leaf, they'll put also a little length of stem so that the next leaf will emerge at the tip of that bit of stem. So they are different. They have a completely different way of growing. And so they respond very differently to grazing and things like that. Uh, now, um, so we've got these different habits that go along with different growth mechanisms. And so different grasses will branch. The tufted grass plants with non-perennial or short-lived stems normally won't branch or only sparingly and only at, at the base. We also find that the uh, height of a plant varies between species. There are some grasses that never grow very tall and some like bamboo will grow over 10 meters tall in some species. But unfortunately, um, most grasses will reduce their stature according to the growing conditions, as I mentioned, depending on whether it's a drought or they're grazed or trampled or things like that. Um, uh, the next thing I've got here is the stems of nearly all grasses have got leaf nodes between the base of the stem and the top. In other words, if you have a look at your specimens that I asked you to collect, you will find that you might have a few leaves at the base of each stem uh, and you'll have leaves attached up the stem and they're attached to those nodes. And then you've probably collected specimens that have got a seed head at the top. 
And except in the example of the kangaroo grass that I showed you, all the other ones that I've shown you have the leaves up the stems and then a seed head at the end and no leaves in amongst the, the, that seed head bit. Um, now that is right, well, there are, I can think of off the top of my head, only two, I think, grass species in the whole of Victoria out of the 450 roughly species in Victoria of grass that don't have any leaves attached at intervals up the stem. All the others do. The genus Carex, which is uh, the true sedges, um, never have a single leaf between the seed head or inflorescence and the base of the plant. It'll have leaves around the base of the plant in a tuft, but they're all attached at ground level or mud level, depending on what it's growing in. Um, but no leaves attached up the stem, very different from nearly all grasses. Uh, most rushes are like that. Many other sedges are like that. So if you see a grassy plant, but you don't see that it's got, and, and you've got a stem and the stem is flowering, but you don't see any leaves attached up the stem, either it's not a grass at all, or it will be one of a very select few grasses that don't have leaves attached up the stem. So that's really important to know. Um, there's a wallaby grass in that category. So that's really useful for dis oh, two, two wallaby grasses. They're both alpine. Um, Okay, and one other thing that's worthy of note about uh, stems is that if you've got a grassy looking plant and the cross section of the stem is triangular, and you'd be looking for this particularly just under the seed head, that's where it usually is most developed. If you find that you've got a triangular cross section to the stem just underneath the seed head, then it's in the sedge family. In fact, it'll be a carex or a cypiris, also pronounced cyperus or various other ways. Um, or it could be, I think, uh, yeah, they're, they're the main ones. Um, in other parts of the world outside Victoria, there may be others, but triangle cross section means it's not a grass. It will be a sedge. Um, yeah, yeah, the, uh, well, in the sedge family at least. So um, stems actually hold some really useful information. So does the growth, growth of the stems because as I've said, the stems uh, emerge from, well, particularly in a tufted plant, they emerged um, initially protected inside leaf sheaths. At the end of uh, the stem or a side branch of a branch stem, the seed head will eventually emerge from inside that leaf sheath. And as soon as the top of that inflorescence or seed head emerges, it will start flowering uh, within a day or two as a rule. And uh, it'll start putting out its anthers with the pollen that spread on the wind and it'll put out its little feathery stigmas to catch the pollen. And so uh, we have this situation where in a, an inflorescence of a grass, they flower from the top to the bottom. Now you think about an orchid or a lily or a rose or a eucalypt or the vast majority of the plant kingdom where you've got an inflorescence, which just means a, an arrangement of flowers on a plant, they will flower from the bottom to the top. Um, and in, in, I should explain that in botany, when we use the terms top and upper and things like that, we mean uh, the bit that's furthest out from the root system of the plant. So it might be drooping downwards, um, doesn't matter. The bit that's furthest from the base of the plant, we still call the top. So um, they, uh, the, the bit that's furthest from the root system is the first bit to flower, and that's the uh, in a grass, and that's the reverse of most of the plant kingdom. And that is really important. Um, it means that the first part of the seed head to mature, the, uh, the seeds will mature, are the ones at the top. That's really important for management purposes because, or, or if you want to collect the seed for harvesting, because if you want to know whether any seeds are ripe, then first you'd be looking over your patch of the particular species of interest and you would be looking for a seed head which has protruded 
as much as any of the others out of their uppermost leaf, a protective leaf, which we call the flag leaf. So you look around and you see which seed head seems to be as far protruding beyond its flag leaf as any other. And then you go to the top of that because that is where the seeds will be most ripe. And then you check for ripeness. And you can do that, I'll show you this in the field days, but um, for those of you who aren't coming the field day, coming to the field days, the tip is use your thumbnail against, well, put, put the, the seed between your forefinger and squeeze it with your thumbnail. If it feels hard, uh, where you might expect a grain to be inside the grass seed, then it's probably right. If it just collapses or if it gets milky liquid coming out, it won't be right. That's really important whether you either want to collect the seed when you might want to leave it a bit longer. Uh, if you find that the seeds, even, uh, even the most advanced, are not quite ripe. But if you've got something like Chilean needle grass as a, an environmental weed or a pasture weed in Victoria, you don't want to wait until the seeds are ripe. If you find that they're starting to get ripe, then it's probably already too late to do anything this year and you might be better off um, focusing your efforts somewhere else. You really need to know when grass seeds are ripe so that you know what management measures to take. Um, and uh, here's another tip for the people who aren't coming to the field days. It typically takes about four weeks to go from flowering stage to uh, seeds being ripe for uh, a grass. So um, knowing that uh, grass seed heads flower from the top down and that they initially emerge from the sheath and ultimately in all cases, bar in Victoria, Volpia myuros and the, well, there are a couple of species of trobium with those rare exceptions, once they're mature, you will find that there will be a seed head on a, a bit of branch um, that uh, protrudes beyond the top leaf. Kangaroo grass, I guess, is a, a bit more complicated. And in the tropics, you have quite a few grasses that are more complicated. But for most grasses, once they're mature, you will find that the seed heads emerge from uh, or are well protruding beyond the top leaf. Now I'm seeing it, it's 20 to nine, so I'm going to have to rock it along a fair bit. Um, now, grass seeds, if you give me a grass seed in Victoria, chances are I'll be able to tell you what the species is just from one seed. They are that distinctive in nearly all cases. Um, don't give me a poa seed because I'll only be able to narrow it down somewhat. Um, but for most grass species, the seeds are quite distinctive. Now, a distinctive thing about grasses as opposed to all the other similar sorts of uh, families or the similar looking families of plants is that grasses alone produce the seed um, formed as a grain surrounded by some husks. The number of husks varies in the grass seed, but there will be husks in nearly all cases. In Victoria, we have the sporobolus species such as rat's tail, and I'll probably be, be able to show you some of that in at least one of the field days. Um, uh, and there are some native species of Sporobolus in Victoria as well. They are a bit different. They've evolved away the, the protection that the husks of the grass normally provide. If you think about uh, our cereal crops, uh, when they're harvested, the grain has to be threshed from the husks. You, you don't want to have all those husks in your uh, rolled oats in your muesli, for example. So uh, that's the structure of a grass seed. I'll just call them grass seeds. It's not a botanical term. It's just what you might call them in normal parlance. Um, now, the, the way that the grass seeds are packed into the seed head uh, can be quite, um, well, it is quite variable from one species to another and can be rather confounding. Uh, at this point, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can show you a technique that will make it a bit easier. And I will swap to the other camera. 
Um, now, I, the grasses that I directed you to collect, I did so, or rather I chose those because it's easy to see the branches and you can see the, uh, the spikelets and usually the, the grass seeds inside the spikelets without too much trouble. But then when you get something like a, a uh, spirobolus or in this case, rat's tail grass, grab one of those. Uh, where's my rat's tail grass? Uh, there, no, that, that's not coming to hand, but I've got something else that will do. Here is sweet vernal grass, an extremely common species in Southern Victoria. And um, how are you gonna make sense of that? Where are the spikelets and where are the seeds? Well, once it's ripe, you would see the seeds because you'd be able to tap them out onto your hand. And there's a tip. As the season goes on, um, it becomes much easier to identify grass because the grass seeds become more evident and they become often fluffier and more distinctive. And that's why we're not doing the field days yet. You can see lots of grasses at the flowering stage, but it becomes much easier to identify once the seeds are ripe. So we've got something, uh, particularly at this time of the year, which is rather complicated and you can't see whether there's branching there until you do this. It is uh, a standard thing that I teach all of my students to uh, flex an inflorescence or seed head if you can't see the branching in it. And if I take this branch and flex it around, you can see now that there are spikelets there. And each one of those spikelets is on its own little branch. So if you've collected a grass such as a coxfoot, um, or something remotely like this. You might have a Yorkshire fog, for example. Similar situation, uh, particularly at certain stages of the development. In order to be able to see branching of a seed head that's rather dense, you flex it. And once you see some branches, then you flex those. And that will make things more evident. I've uh, really got to race along now. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And, uh, okay, uh, um, once the seeds have been shed, as I've shown you in the YouTube video, what is left behind in most cases is a, a pair of husks for each spikelet. And I've got a picture there to show you what a typical pair of these glooms, as they're called, will look like. Um, a few species uh, will drop their uh, glooms as part of the grass seed. That's part of the reason why some um, species have got more husks around the grain than others. Um, so noting whether the pairs of glooms are left when the seeds are shed or not is quite useful for identification, whether in the tropics or in the temperate zones. Now, um, Horns are really common on a grass seed. Here's a photograph of, that I took uh, in, um, uh, near Bendigo. And uh, there's spear grass seeds, and you can see these wavy bristles, uh, which we call horns. And um, they have a particular function. Uh, and I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to show you exactly what they do now. I'm going to give you an exercise. Those of you who've found oats, and I hope most of you found, found them, and they're quite easy to find. Um, they, they have horns that are uh, quite typical of grasses. In fact, in Victoria, more than half, I think well more than half of all Victorian grass species, native and introduced, have got horns of one kind or another. And they are, in nearly all cases, really important for dispersal. Um, just a hint, uh, if I have a look at, say, this seed, I can see that it's got a shaft. All spear grasses have got a shaft-like thing, and the shaft of a spear, and it's got a spear head with a sharp point. You'll see that the sharp point has got down into a little crack there, and uh, the, it's 
pointing vertically and what you'll find is that when the rain comes, these will act like little drills and they will drill all of these seeds into the ground. In fact, some of them are already well into the ground in this photo. Um, what I'd like you to try is to get your, uh, from your oak plant or an oak plant that you might find, a ripe seed out of it. Uh, here's one that I collected earlier. Uh, what did they say in the, in the cooking shows? Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, your mature grass or oat seed will look something like this. And you'll see it's developed a right angle bend. And if I could get it close enough up and in focus, you would see that that's twisted. What I want you to do is to, to get one or two of these, oh, the more the merrier really, and um, put them on a bench top or something like that. Give them a, a light squirt with some water. Use a, I use a, an atomizer and uh, you, you'll see what they do. They're amazing. If you watch them over the subsequent 30 to 60 seconds, they're like animals. Uh, okay, I uh, really got to get going and I must share my screen again. So many grasses, so little time. Okay. Um, now, uh, you've got the idea uh, from what I've been saying so far that there are these things called spikelets. Uh, and in most cases, they'll be out on the ends of the branches, but I've already introduced you to uh, ryegrass as an example, or antherforous ryegrass as examples of where the spikelets don't actually have stalks. They're attached directly to the central stem of the, uh, of the inflorescence or seed head. Um, now, it so happens that in the grass family, there are some uh, species, in fact, uh, it's genus by genus, uh, this applies, some species will always have just a single grass seed inside each spikelet. All the other species never have just one. So noting whether your grass has just a single seed in, such as a spear grass, um, or has multiple ones really helps narrow things down. It splits the, the family into two large groups. So that's an important thing to note. Uh, and uh, here is a, an example of what a wallaby grass um, spikelet looks like in Southern Victoria. Um, pretty commonly, you, you'll find lots looking like this right at the moment. Uh, today was a perfect day for them, to be, for them to be flowering, which happens in the morning. Nearly all grasses flower in the morning. I know of one wallaby grass that flowers in the uh, late afternoon and evening, but nearly all grasses flower in the morning. And you'll see this sort of thing with the feathery stigmas and anthers. And we can see that we've got uh, the seed head, um, main, branch, main stem called a rachis, if you want to know. And then we've got the stalk of the, pedis, uh, of the spikelet, and that's called a pedicel for the boffins. Then we've got a pair of glooms. There's one there and the uh, other one called the upper gloom, lower and upper gloom. Uh, and they clasp around what, well, there's a, a grass seed developing inside there, another one there, another one there. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six. I think I can see six in there. So that's what a spikelet might look like. Now, the branching in a seed head, he says as he looks over to see that it's eight minutes to nine. Um, the branching is really important to notice. So I've already introduced you to ryegrass, which you'll see here. A native equivalent to that, well, I've shown you the forest ryegrass. It's native and it has no... Well, it has the spikelets attached directly to this uh, central um, part of the stem called the rachis. Um, perhaps the most widespread uh, and common of the native species with that structure is the common wheatgrass or Anthosacne scabra, which I'll be able to show you, I expect, on the field days. But that's what it looks like at this time of the year. Um, then there are various variations. There are the so-called digitate inflorescences. I think of them as being like uh, the arms on a hill's hoist or that sort of thing. Cooch would be a common example. This is the windmill grass or Chlorus truncata. Uh, another variation on that theme is uh, where each of these arms on a paspalum 
um, looks like a caterpillar and the spikelets, which you would be able to see by flexing each one of these branches. You can't see them there, but you flex them, you'll see that there are little spikelets. You'll see that every second one has got a tiny little stalk. Uh, so that's a, a rather different sort of structure. And then the majority of grasses uh, will have what are called panicles. And the uh, grasses that I got you to collect, the oat, the prairie grass, and the large quaking grass would all be called panicles. And they've got branches coming off that central branch or rachis, and typically other branches coming off those branches and so on. And they may be either open or diffuse where you can readily see the branches, or they can be dense, as in the case of this Yorkshire fog. Even Yorkshire fog, uh, fans out whilst it's spreading its pollen to become more like the bottom right photo here. Then there's kangaroo grass. There are other species of Themida. There's one other in Victoria and there are several species um, up in the subtropics and tropics, including in Australia, one introduced species and several native species. Kangaroo grass is very distinctive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, gee, five minutes to wrap up the essential bits and then just a little time for questions. Um, here's my suggestions for what to look at. I'll be going through all this on the field days, but some of you won't be going to the field days. The first thing is to look at the habitat and in your character list of characters that you develop, maybe you had something about whether the grass is growing in wet conditions or that sort of thing, that's important. Um, the overall appearance, yes, you want to look at that and uh, that's good. Whether the stems are branched or not is really important, but hardly anybody thinks to look for it. <coughs> Pardon me, I need a drink. Okay, uh, so look for whether they're branched. Check whether there are leaves up the up the stems. If there aren't, either it's a very rare case of a grass without leaves up the stems, or else it's probably a, a sedge or a rush. Then you start to look at what the leaves are like, and I won't go through all that again. You've got to keep in the back of your mind the question of whether what you're looking at really is a grass. Because if you use resources to identify a grass, but your specimen isn't really a grass, that's not going to work. You want to look at the seed head or inflorescence if you've got one for the branching in it, how dense it is, um, and all those other sorts of things that I've illustrated in the previous slide. And then pretty soon you'd be wanting to look for grass seeds, particularly when we get later on into the season in the Southern Hemisphere, because grass seeds are just so distinctive. Okay. Um, we could take questions now, but I want to show you wallaby grasses and spear grasses so that when we go out into the field, for those of you who are coming to the field days, you've um, had some forewarning of what we're going to be looking at. And you'll, well, usually after my first session or two of teaching people about grasses, people come back to the next session and say, Hey, I never realised there were so many wallaby grasses. I find that I can now spot them driving along at 60 kilometres an hour. And with a bit of practice, that's not too difficult. So the uh, photograph at top left is alpine. Our field days are not alpine, but your typical wallaby grass does look something like that, even if it's in the mallee. Um, so that's what a typical wallaby grass or Ritidosperma species looks like. Some people pronounce it ritidosperma, but a ritid is a wrinkle, wrinkle seed it needs. So it's, it's ritidosperma. And the seeds are quite distinctive. And I've got three photographs from different species. There's ritidosperma fulvum, ritidosperma racemosum, uh, because of where the thing is there. Oh, now I can see the other ones, the brown back wallaby grass, ritidosperma dutanianum. So they all look quite different once you get to know about them. But... Um, why are they called wallaby grasses? I'll, I'll give you a, a hypothesis, totally unproved hypothesis as to why they're called wallaby grasses. Uh, I'm going to do this because it'll help you remember uh, something about um, what to look for in a wallaby grass. 
one of my students a decade or two ago uh, told me they thought that it was because when you look at one of these seeds, it can look a bit like a wallaby with a tail there and a couple of legs. And another student told me that they thought it was because when you look at the seed this way up, it looks a bit like the head of a wallaby with you know, a tip of a snout there and a couple of ears. And then I said, I wonder what you've been on because I haven't come across a wallaby that's got a horn in between the two ears. But then I thought, ah, unicorns do. Oh, I wish they were called unicorn grasses because that is going to allow me when we're out in the field to talk to you about what to look for in the, in the seeds of a wallaby grass. I'm going to tell you things like grab your seed by the horn of the unicorn and look at the two ears and see how long the bristles are on the two ears because one of our local species in the Melbourne region has a really short bristle on each ear and ones like this are much longer. This is actually a Tasmanian species, but very similar to a Victorian one. Um, and I'll be able to tell you, have a look at the hairs around the snout and that sort of stuff. And these things are what distinguishes one wallaby grass from another, one species from another. So that's why it's important for you to have this concept of the head of the unicorn uh, in order to distinguish one wallaby grass from another. So yeah, there, there's the picture of the wallaby grass. And uh, yeah, another interesting thing about wallaby grass is that I can only think of one other grass species in Victoria, and I can't think of any anywhere else in the world, um, which has this particular feature. Here's a zoomed in picture of Ritidosperma racemosum, the so-called clustered wallaby grass, showing that it's got an awn the horn of the unicorn, whose darker coloured base is twisted, and all wallaby grasses or Ritidosperma species have this general structure. And as they dry out, the lower part uh, coils like coiling ribbon. Note that it is like a ribbon in its coiling, and not like a spear grass or, well, I said uh, more than half of Victorian grass species have got horns. Nearly all the others have got horns like this. Uh, the only other species that I'm aware of that has a ribbon-like horn that uh, twists like curling ribbon is the silky bluegrass, and it doesn't look remotely like a wallaby grass in any other respect. All the others have what I might call a barber's shop pole sort of um, uh, horn or twisted part of the horn. Uh, you could also think of it as being like rope. Um, so quite different. It's not like a ribbon. It's more like rope. Okay, now why do they have this sort of thing? I'm going to play you a video which I photographed and sped up by a factor of four. And oh, darn, sorry, I'll go back. It can sometimes be temperamental to get it started. Oh, come on. We're, it's one minute past nine. Oh, it's a pity. Okay, I'm going to have to dispense with that. It worked fine just beforehand, but oh, there we go. Oh, there, oh it started and then I inadvertently stopped it. Okay, here we go. Sped up a factor of four. I just plucked it out of its uh, spikelet. And this is what happens. And if it had just fallen naturally out of its spikelet, uh, it would fall to the ground and it would be doing this. And I just sprayed it with a bit of water there. And you might have noticed that it wound back up again. Every time the rain comes, it, it unwinds. And when it dries out, it winds up again. So if you can imagine this down in the leaf litter or in this uh, at ground level, it will continually be wriggling around. It's got all these barbed hairs and so on, which means that it's just not wriggling around randomly. It has some sense of purpose. It wants to go towards that pointy end, which will ult ultimately help get it in the ground. So that's why um, the majority of Victorian grasses, in fact, around the world, have got these horns that helps disperse the seed. Wallaby grasses and spear grasses are the two biggest groups of native grasses in Victoria. So before we meet 
um, in, at the field days, those of you who are going, I wanted to introduce you to the general appearance of the spear grass and how to distinguish them from the um, introduced needle grasses in the genus Nacella. Um, and this is even more important if you're not coming to the field days, and particularly if you're in one of the many parts of Victoria where Chilean needle grass or a few of the other ones are a serious problem in agriculture or in the environment. A spear grass and a needle grass both have the properties that there is just one seed inside each pair of glooms. So when the seeds are shared, you just get one seed falling out and they are structured a bit like a spear in that it's got a shaft and it's got a head and a sharp point. Um, however, like all of the uh, awns, uh, nearly all awns on grasses, when they dry out, they twist and they develop a kink and that's to help make them wriggle around on the ground um, when they get wet and dry out again. So that's true so far of both a spear grass and a needle grass. The important difference with the needle grasses is that uh, around the base of this awn, the shaft of the spear, so to speak, is a collar called a corona. Corona, those of you who speak Latin languages or uh, uh, like Portuguese or Spanish or whatever, corona means a crown. So it's supposed to look vaguely like a crown, but I think of it like... Um, uh, a flap of tissue, yeah, we'll call it a crown. It, it surrounds the base of the awn and our native spear grasses never have that. They may have hairs around the base of the awn, but never one of these uh, vaguely crown shaped structures. Uh, there's also a bit of a difference in that most spear grasses have got hairs scattered all over the, the spearhead part of the seed, whereas uh, the needle grasses don't, they have large bare patches, although you'll see that there's a line of hairs there. Um, now, if you're up in the Mallee, beware, because uh, in the Mallee and to a lesser extent in other parts of Victoria, there are native spear grasses that aren't anywhere near as hairy as this. They're not quite as bald as this, but they're not nearly as hairy as that either. So, um, that is as much as I have time to show you uh, because it's now six minutes past nine. Sorry, guys, I've gone over time. There's always more uh, material to go through than um, I ever have time to do. Uh, but for those of you who are coming to the field days, I'll show you a whole lot more then. So sorry about running over time. Uh, there is the link again to the um, handouts of the slides. And Robert, I'll let you uh, supervise the question session. Thanks very much, uh, Graham. Um, it's like a, a world opening up um, once you get into the detail of, of any any field like this, and this was no uh, no different. Uh, I didn't expect us to get to the snouts of unicorns, but uh, there you go. <laughs> um, look, there hasn't been any extra questions in the chat so I might just um, open it up to the floor if you've got a particular question maybe you can um, uh, take yourself off uh, mute and ask that there, there was just one question then about whether um, buffalo grass is becoming a problem in Victoria I would say not um, let's see um, it's been in Victoria for a very long time. Not all the cultivars, like you've got your, what is it, Sir Walter, is that the, the second last fad in lawn? Um, it doesn't reproduce very well, uh, other than vegetatively. So it spreads from where it's put by its uh, runners, but it doesn't have windblown seed or anything like that. So it tends not to spread very quickly. Um, so it, it, if 
if uh, the seriousness of buffalo grass is one on a random scale, then Chilean needle grass in Victoria would be about 500 because its seeds are spread almost entirely by humans, mostly by slashes and agricultural machinery. Um, left to its own devices, the ants eat nearly all seeds of Chilean needle grass, but humans spread it extremely readily. Humans do not spread uh, the buffalo grass. Um, Graham, other than um, not, I, I need to correct something. I read the question out incorrectly. It was buffle, buffle oh, grass. Buffle grass. Buffle grass. <laughs> okay, buffle grass. Um, I imagine it's moving into the Mallee. So this might be a question from Northern Victoria, I'm thinking. Um, green plants have two main kinds of photosynthesis called C3 and C4. Uh, we often, within the grasses, we uh, often hear about them being called the summer growing grasses and the winter growing grasses, which is not very accurate because when winter growing grasses don't grow much in winter, they grow principally in spring and to some degree in autumn. But um, buffalo grass is one of those uh, grasses that you might call more summer growing but the other way of thinking is that it needs more sunlight and heat to thrive so I don't think it will ever be a problem in Tasmania uh, we do have climate change and so I have seen over the past decade or two a steady change in some species that haven't been able to thrive in southern Victoria um, and it used to be there was a fairly clear divide between the sort of grasses you got north of the Great Divide as opposed to south. That uh, the geographic divide is no longer as good a divide between the grasses you get uh, north and south of the divide. So buffalo grass um, might well be increasing. I don't see it significantly south of the divide. If, if it's becoming a problem, it would be more north of the divide. And I haven't been doing much work north of, north of the divide in recent years. So um, I'll say, I don't see it as a problem, at least yet, south of the divide. It might be north of the divide and I'm just not familiar with it because I haven't been doing enough work in the appropriate places north of the divide. Um, and it's the, the, the movement of plants and the difference in tolerance uh, that plants will have to have is in, in the face of climate change creates all sorts of problems for us in agriculture, the crops we can grow, the weeds we have to deal with and all those sorts of things. It's just one of uh, many problems that we have to deal with with climate change. There's a, a question just asking for your recommendations for good field guides. Um, If your, if your objective is to know something of the main native grasses, there's a lovely, um, quite small book by Meredith Mitchell called, uh, uh, what's it called? Na native Grasses. It's got a subtitle. Uh, but Meredith Mitchell, uh, and it's directed towards uh, people with pasture and uh, Meredith is from Rutherglen, Glen. And so there is a bit of a bias towards the north of divide sort of native grasses, but it does have a, a range of species from south of the divide. It has excellent photographs. Most books about grasses have terrible illustrations. Um, usually I can't uh, recognize the species from the illustrations and you know you give me a decent photo and or a decent line drawing and I'll be able to tell you what they are but the illustrations that one actually finds in books I find are very poor. Um, uh, Grasses of New South Wales is coming out with a fifth edition. I'm still writing some of the chapters and others are writing chapters and COVID-19 has really thrown a spanner in the works, but we're hoping that grasses of New South Wales will come out. You might be thinking, but I'm in Victoria, if you are. Um, nearly all Victorian grasses also grow in New South Wales, and it's quite a good book. Uh, online resources, I've mentioned Vic Flora um, and iNaturalist, and I think that'll have to do. All right, thanks. 
Um, a few more questions. Is, is chili and needle grass the same as brome grass? No, nothing like it. Here's, here's one of the, here's where you start to apply the things that I've told you tonight. If you have a look at something that you believe to be brome grass, have a look for the spikelets. They're really easy to find. It's a relative of, um, uh, well, the, the brome grasses are in the genus Bromus and prairie grass is one of them, although we call that prairie grass. The other ones we call things like rip gut brome and great brome and things like that. If you look at a, a brome, as in the case of prairie grass, but also with any of the others, you'll easily see the branches and you'll see the spikelets and you'll see the two glooms, which are the two outermost husks most directly attached to the, the little branches. And then you'll be able to see the seeds inside them. And you will see that there will be typically four, five, six, depending on the species. But remember, Chilean needle grass, I said, only ever has one. Remember, there are some uh, genera, um, you can think of species if you like, there are some species of grass where they will always have just one. And the needle grasses and the spear grasses are in that group. Whereas the bromes never have just one. So you should never um, confuse the two as long as you've got a, a spikelet of each because they fall in those two completely different groups. Just before um, we stop the recording, Graham, uh, I just want to mention one, one thing, which is the Melbourne Waters Livable Communities um, program, which supports some of the education activities, such as tonight. Um, and if you uh, have got waterways um, on your property, uh, they're a good resource to have a look at some of their... Um, their programs to support fencing off repairing waterways and other things. So we will continue uh, for another five or 10 minutes if that's okay with Graham, but we will stop the recording now and thank everyone that has joined us this evening and thanks uh, for watching our, uh, our uh, webinar tonight. And um, uh, I don't know, Jason, whether you have in mind some way of gauging